Hey, what up everybody? Tim Castleman here and welcome to a very special edition of the Two Drink Tim podcast. I know I say that every time I have a musical guest, but I am beyond thrilled and honored uh, to have this musical guest because he was my very first musical crush, if you will, and is the only musician that actually has lyrics displayed in the Two Drink Tim podcast studio. So with that, I am excited to share with you one of my first loves of music and one of the guys that got me to start going to live music, following musicians on the road, uh, possibly to a stalkerish level. We'll talk about the legalities of that <laughs> as we get into it. But ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am honored to welcome to the show Mr. Ryan Montblou. Thank you very much, Tim. I'm honored to be stalked by you. Sir. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You, know, you haven't, you know, accepted my friend request yet. I'm okay with that. I'm just going to let that go. <laughs> oh. You know, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go through this process. But, you know, where I want to start with you, man, is the beginning. So, you know, how does uh, Ryan Montblou uh, enter the world? When and where uh, were, were you born? And what first got you interested or excited in music? Uh, well, I was born in June of 1977. I was born in Lynn, Massachusetts, and I, um, I, uh, I grew up on the North Shore of Boston in Peabody, Mass. And, um, and my father played music, um, like in, he was in, he was in a college band and then he was in like some wedding bands and stuff. He didn't really do it for a living by the time I, you know, like saw anything, but, but we'd see him like once in a while, he'd play a show like once a year or something like that. And he had like, his bass and his bass amp like tucked away in a, in a, in a closet. And it was like, and then like when I was eight, he gave me a guitar for Christmas and he gave my brother a keyboard. I think, or yeah. And my brother started playing drums, but eventually my brother played bass. Like, so like it was like something that was around, but it wasn't like, you know, nobody did it for a living or whatever. But as I grew up, I realized like a lot of my family is musical. It's just kind of there. We didn't, we never played together or anything like that. I grew up in like, a very loving house, but it was like a small family and we all just kind of had space to do whatever you wanted to do. Like we were, we're not the kind of family that's really like up in each other's business. There's just kind of a lot of love there. And like, you know, you're sort of given space to, to do your thing. And, um, so yeah, for me, like I played guitar, uh, from when I was eight and like used to play like the crazy train riff or like <laughs> the beginning of Back in Black or something. And then, like, you know, I had my friend come over in seventh grade who played drums, and we just made a bunch of noise. But then I didn't really – I didn't really play much. I mean, I didn't really do much um, in through high school. Like, I would pick up a guitar once in a great while and put it down, and that was it. Like, it was just kind of there, but I never really played it or played for anybody really. And then when I went away to college, my, my parents uh, paid for me to go to school, which was such a blessing, and, and I went to Villanova University. And there was where I like, all of a sudden, all I wanted to do was play guitar. And I got really depressed. And it was just a very like transformative, like really formative years for me, really. Like I was listening to the blues and just playing guitar. And I started writing poetry, like I had to write. And I sort of evolved. I went in a chemical engineering major and then went through the business school and then came out an English major. And like, and then I started studying poetry. And then my last semester of college, I started to sing. And I was in a college band playing like third guitar, college jam band at that time or, you know, what, and then like, so, so it was literally like as I was graduating college, um, you know, the, everyone asked the question, what are you going to do? And that's, you know, sort of like I was getting asked this question, what are you going to do now, now that you're graduating, what are you going to do? And, and then it was like the poetry and the guitar and now suddenly singing sort of all came together. And I was like, I was like, I think I'm going to play music. Wow. It, so yeah. you wouldn't call your family a musical family, but it was there. It was something maybe as a hobby or something that they had they had done and enjoyed doing, but it wasn't like they were performers or it wasn't the family line of business, if you will. Exactly. It's and they are musical, but it yeah, it wasn't it wasn't at all the family business. And it's like, you know, my, my brother plays some gigs now here and there with different bands. He's really talented, but he's like yeah, he's more of like a math guy and he like he plays all kinds of different instruments and my father plays, you know, plays his bass like once a year, he does this gig or something. But yeah, so it's like, it was there. Uh, and you know, my uncle plays guitar and stuff and it was just, it was there, but it wasn't so much this like collective, like playing family, like, Oh, look at dad. He's doing another gig kind of thing. Like it's, that's why I think it sort of came late for me 
as even like an idea to like do it for a living. Yeah, you know that's crazy that you you got it uh, your first guitar uh, and then you put it, you know you played with it and you did it off and on and then you kind of put it away. What do you think kind of made you come back to it in college? I think um, I, I had sold that guitar finally that my father had originally given me i think i sold it to my brother's friend like right as i was like probably later in high school and i got this really crappy beater acoustic guitar and um when i went to college my roommate had a much nicer acoustic guitar <laughs> and i ended up just stealing that all the time but i think it was like definitely like i don't know i was listening to a ton of blues at that time and feeling that like I was really feeling the blues. Like I was feeling, I went through like sort of my first bout with like depression and I was away from home for the first time. And I had my girlfriend at home who I missed and I didn't really understand like why things had to change so much. Like I was starting to get really happy at home and I had all my friends from high school and all that stuff. And I, I really, like, I think that's like a theme in my life. Like I have, I have trouble with things changing so much. And I think music and poetry and stuff is just, part of the way that I deal with that. And for whatever reason, I can filter what I'm feeling into that more than I can maybe deal with it in other ways. So I think that was the first time when it really like, I don't know, it just made sense. It was like the bug bit me. It was like, I all I wanted to do was play guitar. Whereas before I would just mess around on it and put it down. But like all of a sudden, like, you know, my freshman year it was like, I took lessons from a kid down the hall. Like I gave him 10 bucks and he showed me pentatonic scales and then but even before that, like, I was just like, I just, they would, my friends would laugh because, like, they would leave and, like, come back 10 hours later and I was still sitting in the same place in the dorm room just playing guitar. Not necessarily practicing so much, but as, like, just playing, just playing and playing and playing and playing and playing. And that's sort of, I don't know, the, the, the bug just bit me then. So, and it wasn't like you were trying to become a musician. You, you didn't have any aspirations, at least while then. You, so it wasn't uh, like you were trying to hone your craft or, like you say, practice. It wasn't like you were trying to get ready for a gig. It was just something that really interests you. And like you say, you got bit by it, and it, it really helped out. Uh, you mentioned blues. I'm curious, who, who are some of your favorites back then, and, and maybe who some are your favorites now? Uh, well, I mean, there was there was like – you know, early on, there was like Stevie Ray Vaughan and Jimi Hendrix. I was like a Jimi Hendrix nut, but I wouldn't try to play that stuff. It was like, I still don't. It just seemed like too big to touch. Like, I just couldn't even, couldn't even do it. But I would listen to it, and I loved those guys. And then like Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker. And and then also at that time, I got exposed to a lot of like Roots Reggae and like a lot of the, the deeper like Bob Marley catalog and stuff. I had some good friends there. And and, you know, I was smoking a lot of pot at the time. We were drinking a bunch. It was just like those kind of really crazy, emotional, kind of formative years. And yes. then now, since then, like, I mean, I love, like, Elmore James and um, uh, this guy Garrett. Um, what's his name? Um, Garrett Mason. Oh, my God. That's one of my favorite records of the last, like, 10 years. This guy Garrett Mason. It's like a blues record. Many people don't know about him, but I don't know. There's a lot. That's a whole other conversation. No, definitely. Okay, well, I'm writing that one down because I, I definitely want to check that out. So if you're – if you're, uh, I'm sorry. Say again? Garrett Mason, Love and Sound. Okay. Love and Sound. Love and Sound. Like, I could not recommend that record more. So you're going to college. You're you're doing the, uh, the typical college experience. You're jamming on the guitar. When did you start thinking like, hey, maybe I want to take this a little further and either start writing uh, some songs or uh, maybe past that point, maybe even actually start getting on stage? Well, I think like I know that like my freshman year, I started writing songs like I started that I didn't like I I just started writing in general. And it wasn't like a big output. I've never been like a big, um, I don't tend to produce a big volume of words, but I sort of like really, I think I intensely kind of trickle out like small amounts of words. <laughs> so it sort of lent itself to like poetry and songs. And then I would, I would think of tunes. I remember walking around campus and like, yeah, thinking of a song. I remember writing a song in my head and just kind of singing it in my own head to myself. I mean, it was like, this was like, I was kind of afraid to even play guitar in front of anyone at this point. I was really shy. I was really like mute quiet at that point. And like, um, you know, I'm sure smoking weed didn't help, but it was like, it was just, I was very quiet. I was sort of, anybody who knew me knew that I was like a very quiet person. And I started to like make these close friendships and I wasn't as quiet in front of them, but they were really like, I was, it was kind of tough socially. 
Yeah. All right. All right. So you weren't the guy at the college party that we all hated that was like, let me sing you a few songs and then went into uh, uh, Oasis's well, Wonder Wall or anything like that, right? Yeah. No, that's the guy. Yeah. Like the guy who like uh, John Belushi smashes his guitar at Animal House. Right. Like, yeah. I wasn't that guy. You weren't that guy. I was like, right, let me play you an original four bars. Oh, hey, let me play you some Oasis. It's like, oh, okay. Today is going to be the day. Got it. Uh, Got here's, it. Uh, yeah. No, I've never been that guy. I'm still not. I still feel, I mean, at a party, it's almost harder to play than like on a stage in front of a thousand people. It's hard. It's just, it's that much more intimate. It's kind of, you don't want to, I don't know. It's awkward, especially singing. Voices are, can be awkwardly social things like, uh, I don't know. It's just it's a different thing. But no, I was so shy back then. I didn't really do it. And then, I, uh, according to your Wikipedia page, I don't even know if you know you have one of those. Uh, oh. But uh, um, you uh, you started uh, working at the House of Blues, and somewhere mm -hmm. around 1999, according to them, uh, that's the first time you stepped on stage. Uh, well, that was the first time I stepped on stage there. But yeah, 99. Like so, I got I graduated from college in 99 with an English degree, and then I came back home. And then I lived at home for another four years while I tried to figure out what I was doing. But I knew at that point, I was like, all right, I want to play music. And I, so I was like, how the hell do I do this? What do I? So I had applied to get a job at the House of Blues the summer before because I just always liked that place. And it was the original House of Blues. It was, the, it, was, it was like it was actually in a house in Harvard Square. And it was the first one they set up sort of as a prototype for all the ones that were to come. But it was like the first vision of the guy, Isaac, who started that thing. And then it was so it was really small. Um, and then I, yeah, I went back there the next year when I got out of college and I got a job there just to see, like, because it was like they had live music seven nights a week. And it was this small club. I mean, it was it. it I used to sell tickets there and, it, um, you know, it holds 230 people standing. Shoulder oh, to shoulder. Wow, that is tiny. Yeah. yeah. It's a small room. So it was an interesting job. It was weird. It was, I mean, it's such a weird company. It's like a corporate blues club. It's really strange, but it's, but that place was really great. And there was a lot of great people in there. And a lot of great people came through there that sort of made that room bigger than what it was. And so that was like a huge experience of like, and I sort of, and, I, and just, you know, like I worked in the box office. So I got to see kind of the ins and outs of selling tickets for a show. And then I, I was a bar back. I scrubbed the bars. I sort of saw like all the ins and outs of like a restaurant bar kind of thing, which I think is just everybody should have some of that experience, I think. So, yeah, that, that helped a lot. And I would answer the phones for the place. And it was just like and then eventually I got to play there. So like when I first got out of school, yeah, like I picked up like I started playing solo gigs. Uh, I think the first gig I had was down in Cape Cod. And then um and I would set up my dad's PA that he still had from 1967 and just like play for this like courtyard of people outside this restaurant. And then uh, and I just like it was basically four years of like taking any gig I could get. I would play in restaurants. I would play in sports bars. I would I played in TGI Fridays in my hometown. I played like all kinds of terrible gigs. And and then but eventually, like I was working at the House of Blues and eventually I started doing matinees there. Like I remember. Like uh, this guy, Teo Leasmeyer, this amazing guy, he used to book the bands there. And I remember being like all scared to like walk up to him and give him my demo tape that I had made. And uh, eventually he like he, he really I guess he took a liking to me and he was really sweet and he and he put me on some stuff. And so eventually I started to get in there a little bit and we would do some nights with the band eventually. And eventually we were like the last band to ever play there before it closed down. But it was so it was cool. Like I always knew like I had these bar gigs that I sort of had to do. And they sort of helped me for sure, like get my chops and you'd have to, I had to learn some covers for them, but I always kept it a mix. Like I would know that I could do that gig. Like I would be more successful at that gig if I learned even more covers, but I would still keep it to like at least half originals. Cause I just knew that was my, like, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't want to play covers forever. I wanted to play my own tunes. And so, and I would mix those gigs with like every once in a while I had a, real like a legit gig at the house of blues you know and so there was always like i was i feel like i was always sort of on the path to like playing original music wow so you you didn't want to be the wedding singer and uh, and just do nothing but covers um but you know you said some interesting things there uh that i think a lot of musicians forget is that you got to see both sides of the business you got to see the talent side you got to see mm -hmm. how that worked but then you got to see the salesmanship side of it too of how to sell how to promote uh you know and and do basically anything that they needed along with uh improving your chops by getting a bunch of gigs and i know a lot of musicians uh, focus a lot on the talent side and, and that aspect of it 
talented and growing their craft and practicing and writing songs. But I don't know many that I've actually talked to that have had a chance to work in the music business before they got started and while they were kind of coming up. Yeah, I think it's a valuable experience. I mean, I, I just seeing the reality of it, I think for me, <clears throat> I don't know if I thrive so much in like the promotion side of it, but I mean, I would, yeah, I mean, you got to make your own flyers and posters and CD covers and whatever, and you got to like, eat, that's like part of it. But I think for me too, seeing the guts of it all, like seeing like, like in a small room like that, even like how much the guest list would affect like people's take on a show or whatever it was, like you saw like the ins and outs of like the numbers and sort of how the economics did or didn't work. I mean, it's a tough business, you know, but yeah, I think like, I think with anything, I mean, I think, you know, being a successful artist, whatever that means is sort of like this conglomeration of different talents. It's not, it's like, I mean, how many stories are there of like the most talented musician that just kind of never makes it anywhere. It's like, it's not, it's, a, it's like sort of making yourself, successful in any form or in any field seems to be this like combination of different talents that you have so it's like yeah you 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 can sing great okay so what so then what are you saying with that okay you can write lyrics too that's good even even all the playing stuff oh you can play too great you can put a band together okay well maybe you can really promote yourself too or maybe you have some clear vision of how to promote it to people or maybe it's like this there's always like a it's a collection of kind of the talents that you have that that dictate the success that you have. Now, before, you know, obviously House of Blues helped with it, but before you got into the music business, what did you think that the music business was? Like, what was your preconceived notion or or what were your big thoughts before you kind of got to see the reality of it? You know, I, yeah, it's it's interesting. I I, I think I was, I, I was sort of blessed slash cursed slash blessed with, like, just this fire to, like, get out there. When I look back at all the stuff I've done in the last like 12 years, it's like insane the amount of work that we would just do to get on the road and get and just go. And it's like, it's kind of, I don't even know where it came from, but it was like, for whatever reason, when I was getting out of school, it became crystal clear to me that like, this is what I'm doing. And so I put everything I had into it. So there was that drive, you know, but then like, in terms of the industry, I remember like, I remember at that time hearing that, um, like Dave Matthews was didn't didn't sort of make it until he was 34, which seemed like really old to me at the time. I was probably 24 or something, you know, not really old, but I was like, all right, cool. So by the time I'm 34, I'll I'll do that too or something. Not that I wanted to be Dave Matthews, but you know, it was like some kind of model of like, yeah, I if I do this for 10 years, then I'll be at his level, so to speak. Or just like, yeah, at that level, like you know, I I certainly had, it's like this weird balance of like. Part of me had all the comp too much confidence of like, I'm the man, I'm going to take people by storm and I'm a blind freight train streaming out songs. I literally wrote that in one of my first bios because you got to write your own bio. You know, like I was just like, I think naive, you know, like I'm literally a combination of Paul Simon and Stevie Wonder, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> ouch, the hubris to think that like, I mean, I, I think I really thought that. If or, you know, Jimi like, Hendrix and Stevie Ray Vaughan had a child, they would name it yeah, Ryan Mont Blue, right? tone it down a little bit but i think you know it's like you have to have that kind of blind ambition that blind confidence in what you're doing that's otherwise it's like that's how you i think like get through the fear of getting up there you just got to force yourself to keep getting on stage you know it wasn't it was like it was scary but it's like but it's it's just weird i mean it's a weird mix it's like because it's that combined with like oh my god i completely suck um you know it's like the other side of like the feelings you feel about your own music is like this really disheartening, like you can be really hard on yourself. So it can be hard to find that balance, you know, but, but I think like, it's funny, like I had those thoughts early on about, and I wasn't a huge Dave Matthews guy. I wasn't trying to do things like him at all. And, and like, but I don't know, I would still, it's like as a singer songwriter with a band, you'd still get compared to that all the time. And I'm like, you know, but I wasn't really, I really wasn't like Dave's the guy, but it was funny to like, that was like a thing because he got huge and it was like, all right, he didn't make it till he's 34. So by the time I'm 34, like, you know, let me see what I can do. And then it was by the time I was 34, what was that? Yeah. Or like 33, like 2010, we were touring with Martin Sexton and we opened for Dave Matthews, like with Martin. And it was interesting to be like 10 years later to like, to actually physically see and feel what the reality was of like 
just a taste, just a dip a toe in like Dave's world for three, four shows and sort of see what the reality was of like what he had actually done and what it would actually and feel in my bones after 10 years on the road, like what it would actually take to get there. It was a completely different thing. You know, it was, it was, you know, it was interesting just to feel the reality of that as opposed to some fantasy. Well, you know, I think it's, uh, you you talk about confidence and maybe too much confidence and and I agree with you. Uh, You know, I always equate it to, you don't know any better one. And two, if you knew everything you knew, you know, being on the road for as long as you have and in the industry, you know, maybe that would have stopped you at the beginning, but you just think, nope, I'm going to do it different. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to explode. And and I agree with you. I think that confidence has to come from somewhere because it's not coming from external forces at, uh, at the beginning of it. You don't have a lot of fans. You don't have a following. You don't have a ton of supporters. You may even have a lot more detractors uh, than you do people saying, yeah, I think that's a great idea. You should totally give up safety and security in the world and go tour all over the U.S. with, you know, seven smelly guys in a van, you know, for 10 years. Yeah, that sounds like a great uh, idea. Yeah, totally. It's funny. Like, you know, I have, it's, I mean, it's hard. You go through those years and you, I'm still, it's like, man, I'm 38. I'm single. I don't have a family. I don't, you know, like I don't, it's like stability is still kind of, it's all relative, you know, but it's, and I'm super thankful for where I'm at, but it's like, yeah, you make sacrifices to do it. And you see your friends who are like, they got wives and children and lives and, jobs and stuff like that and and you know it's funny it's like the grass is always greener they're like oh man yeah they love what you do right yeah Yeah, you get to go around and do what you love to do and i'm like yeah but you guys have stability and they're like well stability is overrated and i'm like yeah well try giving up stability for 10 years and let me know how that goes like tell me it's overrated you know (laughs) whatever the grass is always greener um yeah i mean i'm i'm Certainly thankful to get to do this. Well, yeah, it's funny you mentioned the stability thing. Bill Burr uh, is a comedian I love, and he has this thing. He's like, I, he's like, I, I dare any one of you to just walk out of your house, leave your key and your cell phones. He goes, if you don't make it two blocks without just freaking the fuck out, like I'll pay you a thousand dollars. He's like, yeah, and and I think I think that's right. Uh, uh, people do. We, we, you know, I, I, I'm guilty of it too. I'm like, oh man, that's such a glorious life. And then you're also looking back and going, man, that's such a glorious life. And and everyone thinks everyone else has it better than they do instead yeah. of trying to appreciate all that they do have. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it is a glorious life, but it's hard. It's hard like anybody else's life. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's probably everybody's got it probably the same. <laughs> it's like it just struggles, you know, and it's like uh, but, it, you know, it is glorious. But that's always what I tell people. It's like really good and it's it can be really hard. So you start in, in 99, you start kind of performing with House of Blues. That leads to your first album, Begin, in 2012, which was your solo. That's your first release. And then your second album, uh, Stages, in 2013. But this was all 100% for you. Well, you're 10 years off on those. What? 2001 was – Begin was 2000 – 2002. Yeah, 2003. Okay. You said 2012. Did right? I really? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I have it written down there. I love that. What I love doing is getting uh, artists on here and then either A, totally messing up their names or B, totally <laughs> not like having their total uh, albums totally wrong. It, I have it down. 2002 began okay. 2013, uh, 2003. See, it did it again, uh, stages. And that was your very first solo live album, right? Yeah. Right. And yeah. so you're doing that. How long were you kind of uh, on your own? Just just Ryan Mont Blue as a one man band? Well, I did like. It, it, it changed like I, I'm, I'm a little hazy on the years, but it was like when I got out in 99, I started playing solo because that's all I had. And I was like, all right, I got to figure out how to do this. And then that within like maybe a year or so, like had had like I started forming a band. It started with just me and a djembe player. And we called it Palabra, but that was like really just me and my songs and, and my buddy Jim playing uh, playing djembe. And then th- then eventually I had like a trio, and it was a drummer James who became my drummer like forever. Uh, well, first it was our friend Dennis, and then James took over, and then and then this guy Paul Finland on bass, and then I had also like I had this trio, and the, which eventually sort of ballooned into like sometimes I would have a seven piece band. I didn't really know what I was doing, but I just kind of like would put things together and uh and then i was doing that for a while and then eventually i was like i I need to go solo again um so that was like 2003 i like there was so there was like a few years in there of, of like experimenting with bands and that's what we played at the house of blues and stuff like that and then um yeah and then i sort of went solo again for 
God, maybe it was 02 and 03 or something like that. And then by the time 03, 04 came around, we were starting to do the band again. And it was really 03 it started. So then by the, that basically turned into the band that we had for like 10 years up until 2013. And how did you meet those guys? Like, what, were they pals? Were they just kind of on the music scene? Were they friends of friends? How did, how did the band that, that toured for so long together, how did that kind of come to be? Yeah, they were like friends of friends. I mean, they, they were from the North Shore. Um, and James Cohen, the drummer, was really like kind of the linchpin in that. He was the one that was in Palabra before that. And like we made a record in my house, like a seven song, like EP thing. And then like when my parents were gone and so he was like there from the beginning. But then I went solo for a while. And then like um, he I had met him at a uh, there was a band called Brother Chameleon. And we had like friends of friends, uh, like mutual friends, basically, that I had kind of led me to that show. And that was the first time I met James. And then we started playing together. And then I went solo for a while. And then eventually in like 2003, he was running. Um, he was running an open jam up in Gloucester, Mass, and he had to put he had to put a, a house band together every week at this place, the Black Horse Tavern, and um, and so one week the band that he put together was like me, him, and his brother Jason on keys, and I think we had our friend Jesse on bass still at that time. Yeah, we did, and then. Um, I brought this guy Aaron Gelb on sax, I think. So it was like basically that open jam and him putting together the house band one week. He had to do it every week. That was what became our band. That's crazy. So you guys were just like randomly paired together by this guy who just need. It was like, hey, I need musicians to fill this this jam band or house band, and that kind of became the nucleus of what what was uh, what turned into out to be the Rhymeop Blue Band. Pretty much, but it wasn't totally random. Like I had played with James, you know, the keyboard player with his was his brother who I knew, but we hadn't played really yet. You know what I mean? And we took our old bass player Jesse. We sort of all knew each other. It was like we hadn't gotten together, and then I had been playing solo shows at the time, and I sort of like had been playing out. I played the House of Blues, and I got some opening slots here and there and stuff. So it was like because I had thrown my name out there and had been out there a lot, it was like, what do we call this thing? And it was like, we'll just call it Ryan Mopley Band. And so that was, that was kind of it. Like, and, and then, you know, and then we were doing a lot of my songs and stuff like that, and then it sort of just became appropriate. But part of the reason we called it Ryan Mopley Band was because, like, we, I, we never really thought of anything better. We tried <laughs> a lot. We would sit in the van and brainstorm, and we just never found anything that we all kind of liked. At one point, we were going to – we always wanted to call it, like, Ryan Mopley and the something – which was kind of hard because, like, I had a lot of syllables in my name. It's, I don't know, there's something about, like, you know, Ben Harper and the Innocent Criminals that just, like, rolls off the tongue. Ryan Mopley and the whatever, just, we couldn't find anything that, like, really rolled off. But at one point, we were going to call it The Big Idea. And we were at a show. We played a show at Johnny D's in, in, in uh, Somerville, Mass. And, and we told everybody, we're like, all right, the new band name is Ryan Mopley and The Big Idea. And it was just, like, silence. Boo! <laughs> it's just, like... That was it. Yeah, so we well, never... Okay, cancel the T-shirt order. We're definitely yeah, we not got... doing that. And that was it. We just never – yeah. So, yeah, <laughs> we just kind of – I always felt a little weird about that band name, you know. But it was appropriate in some ways because I was leading it and I was writing the songs and, you know, I got it. But it was – I just – you know, it just – I don't know. It never sounded that good to me. <laughs> so, so what made you kind of decide? Okay, you know, I, I've got this group of guys that I now uh, want to form this group with, and uh, what made you decide kind of going the uh, group route over the solo stuff that you were uh, had been used to and doing for so many years? Well, the I was all about doing the solo thing, and then the band just like the band kind of took over because the band. I mean, the, those guys really kind of embraced it. And and they and and I think and I had a guy I was working with at the time who was putting me out on the road and he definitely like pushed it, like he was like you should do the band thing more. So that that was part of it. We sort of got pushed to do it, but also the band like just musically kind of took over. Like they just they just kind of embraced all those things. They were all down to play these gigs, and you know I think. And I was sort of in the jam band world, and I just think like, and when you're playing clubs and stuff like that, there's there's a there's a you know there's a there's a power to a band that's kind of undeniable in a club setting and in a drinking setting, 
you know, to play successful solo shows, you really, it really should be a quiet setting, I think, unless you, unless you're doing a different thing. But the thing that I do, I'm trying to draw people in to the songwriting and I'm trying to like draw their hearts in and with the solo thing. And, it, and to do that, you need like a quiet setting. But with a band, like you can just beat people over the head with a beat and, and a rhythm section and just, and just take over just a room. Crank everything up and right. Yeah. yeah. And quiet the crowd. It doesn't even have to be like so crazy loud or something, but it's like you can collectively have this like, groove or something that you establish together and it's like the more we played together we just started doing that more and more and then and then then you start hearing all these things and i remember that feeling of like being on the road with them for the first like few weeks that we had done it and we were playing every night and all of a sudden you start hearing all these little things that we can fix and we can work on and then and then you know we did that for 10 years <laughs> you're just like all right we'll just keep improving and keep improving so how was the creative process different kind of from going from solo to now in a group when it came to either songs for that we're going to play or songs for the record, did you mainly handle that or was it more of a, a group dynamic or decision where you kind of said, Hey, I've got a few lyrics and, and they put together the background. Like how did that process work out? It, it, I think as the years went on, it got more collaborative and, and there would be, there would always be ideas, but mainly it was me being like, here's the song. And, you know, but those guys would all write their parts and stuff. I didn't have idea. I wasn't like, all right, drums, you should do this. And like, I had no idea. Like I was just writing songs on the acoustic guitar and singing them and the electric guitar eventually. But like, you know, so it was basically like they were my songs and I would come with them and I'd be like, this is the plan. This is what, and I sort of like gave the thing a, like a point, an arrowhead, like a direction of like, this is what we're doing. And then those guys like, you know, they came with their parts, they wrote different things, they worked on stuff together, they kind of tweaked things, and they, they like, sort of brought their own part to the equation. Yeah, you know? gotcha. So you basically said, hey, here's the song, here's kind of the outline of it, but they, they brought their individual uh, instruments and made it into a cohesive uh, sound and a uniform sound for each song. Yeah, they did. And I would give them direction sometimes, too. You know, sometimes it'd be like, I don't, that don't feel like that's right or something, or they would fix it. But, I, you know, so it was sort of like, you know, I was the leader, but it, what they really did, yeah. I mean, they all had, like, their own voices on their instruments, you know. And I was just kind of really drawn to their instruments and drawn to them as people. And they, they, they really, like, those guys did so much work. And they just, like, they did so many gigs. And that was the thing. We were just, like, gigging machines. So we just like really just, you know, that thing, um, like I was saying before, when I was in my dorm room and I wasn't necessarily practice, 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 I was playing, playing, playing. We kind of did that as a band. Like, I mean, we would practice and we would rehearse and stuff, but we really just like, just, you know, repetition makes the master. We would just, we would just, we just played so many shows and we got so many miles under our belts and we eventually like became this tight thing. It took a while, you know. But, um, and in between and, all those gigs, you guys managed to produce five albums. Did we really? Yeah, yeah. One Fine Color, 2006. Yeah, we had a live one, too. Yeah, yeah, Patience on Friday, 2007. Heavy on the Vine, 2010. Life at Life is Good, or Live at Life is Good. See, I can't get through it without messing one of them up at 2011. <laughs> and then Growing Light in 2015, which is your latest release. So let me ask you, what was the most exciting thing or the most interesting or the funnest part of being part of a group of musicians like this? Well, I think, I mean, one part of it was that, like, everyone just had this drive to get better. Like, those guys weren't satisfied. Like, those guys never had the attitude of, like, we're the best, you know, like, ever. It was just, like, they, they really were, like, there was this added, there was this thing of just sort of getting humbled by music and other musicians. And so it sort of, it set this tone of, like, we need to work harder on our stuff. Almost to a fault by the end. It was like, sometimes it was like, God, we need to just accept what we're doing as like, it's good. You know, that was like the struggle as opposed, you know, but we would like, I don't know. They just wanted to, to like, just get better at what we were doing. And we did, you know. Now you I mean, talk was, about getting humbled. Like, like, can you give me an example or maybe explain to people who don't quite understand when you say like, okay, I'm getting humbled by other musicians or music. Was it like a bad gig? Was it a bad uh, trip? Was it, or was it just like seeing an amazing artist that maybe you guys were opening up for and everyone kind of looking at each other and going, uh, we got some work to do. Yeah, it was really like, 
And there was some of that for sure. And like we'd open for a band, you'd be like, wow, they got it. You know, they, they really, that's where I want to get to. They, they'd have it together or something. But like, but it was like listening too. I mean, because a lot of those guys listen to jazz and stuff. And it was like, I mean, if you're a musician and you can like listen to and appreciate jazz players, it's like you got to just at some point got to throw your hands up and be like that. You know, not it's all music. So it's not, you know, I'm almost a little I was just talking to my roommate today. It's like I'm I'm still a little scared of jazz because it's like that's like the ultimate music. I think, you know, it's like I don't know. It just it was like this is appreciation for players and this like. You know, even though you're never going to get there, you got to like just keep practicing and, I don't know, keep honing your craft. And then, you know, like eventually, like I said, like you're this this conglomeration of different things that makes you good at what you do. And everybody brings their own dynamic, their own musical history, their own influences yeah. to the group. Yeah. And I will say the other part of the, I, that the question you asked as far as like the, the sort of greatest part of being, you know, with a bunch of musicians like that for so long, it was like, the van is like this like incubator kind of it's like this it's like a little experiment it's like a petri dish it's like you're just rolling 70,000 miles a year in this metal box together and you just go deep with each other like the stuff you end up talking about is like it's you can't even believe it's coming out of your mouth sometimes it's like joking and whatever and then it was like when you're young and you're doing that we're on the road we're getting free drinks we're like meeting girls whatever it is we're just we're experiencing new towns and it's just like the whole thing is like this rolling like just throwing your soul out there every night you know and it's, and and it's like a roller coaster you know like some nights you're sleeping on a disgusting floor another night for some by some miracle you're like put up in some palace of a house or a hotel or whatever you know it's like it's still like that a bit but i think especially in the early years you're really just like it's such a ride yeah i've I've talked to a lot of bands especially getting started and they're just like so excited when the, they're like the venue's paying for the hotel and they're like what like we have a hotel to sleep like we're not gonna you know and and i've uh i've been in some of those vans they are not only an incubator of ideas they are an incubator of just life like they're like where's that hoodie i don't know it's like in the third seat under five pounds of you know funyun bags and oh it's it's hilarious to be in there and just see how it is a very tight group that are very much focused on each other but all of the the craziness that occurs it is an it's like an incubator of filth and life and beauty <laughs> it's, like, it's just yeah it's, it's pretty funny you 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 know you there i don't know it's just it, it gets there's like this culture you develop inside the van because it's just you guys and you spend so many countless hours together that you just sort of you know you you have this way of making each other laugh or driving each other nuts or whatever it is that it's like once you get outside the van it's like a different world but in there it's like you have this kind of bizarre family life you know yeah now you know we talked about the amazing things what were some of the maybe more challenging things uh, a part of being a band except for the fact that you know of course now you've got you know tons of guys that know how to push your buttons and and know what's <laughs> going to get you going but what what were maybe some of the other challenging things you found uh going from being a solo artist to more in a band or group environment well i don't know if i would have like been conscious of it at the time but like it's definitely, I mean, it's stressful, especially when you're kind of leading this thing with your name on it and it sort of comes down to you in the end, you know, like it, it's just, I don't know, eventually, you know, we're a bunch of grown men in a van. You know? All right. Like, we grew from the 20 something year old guys to like the 30 something year old men with, you know, and guys have families at home and stuff like that. So I think like there's just a whole ball of wax there of like people are trying to make a living at this and you're just, just putting people through the ringer and you have to play so many shows to keep the thing rolling. And it's just, I mean, you, when you sort of pick a direction and you go for it and you, you kind of start rolling the ball downhill, you kind of just, you can keep going. You really can. People are like, how do you do it? And it's like, cause they're like, I don't know. I could, I couldn't be on the road like that. And it's like, well, you just do it, you know? But after a while, it's like, man, it's intense. It's hard on your body. You lose touch, you lose your body kind of, and then when that goes, your mind starts to go, and it's just like it's a it's a grueling amount of work. It's weird to never be in the same place for very long, including home, and it's like you know you sort of haven't worked on your home life, worked on your relationships, work you know like your friendships are like there, but you know you haven't sort of nurtured those relationships and stuff. So there's a lot you give up 
a ton to do it. Yeah, and I was going to ask you about that. Like, how, how do you do that? Uh, maybe the answer is you're not able to, but how is it that you're able to do that while you're on the road? Because uh, I know one of the, the things that I try to do is keep in contact with uh, my friends on a regular basis. And a lot of times they go dark for weeks or months at a time, not because mm -hmm. they are being rude uh, or maybe they are and I just don't know, but like they're just on the road so much, you know, and it's like they'd love to have that connection and that time to talk, but they're just crazy busy. And that even includes when you when you roll back through town, especially if it's a limited time engagement, because it's like, hey, we'd love to hang out, but we have radio, we've got all this other stuff we've got to do to try and make this stuff work. Um, so how how were you able or were you able to uh, find a way to kind of balance that in a way that made may, maybe didn't make perfect sense, but at least felt you, gave you some level of satisfaction or, hey, I, I'm doing the best I can? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, to be honest, I think I just barely balanced it or, you know, I mean, it's, uh, I just barely held on to my sanity and it's been, and that goes to this very day. I mean, right now I'm like literally still trying to sort of get my feet on the ground and get my bearings and build some kind of home life. I had thought I was doing it in the past and then I really wasn't, you know, like, and I lost relationships and, you know, it's, I think, I think, I mean, I think it comes from that original crazy drive, whatever it was, to just do this and to feel like, okay, this is why I was put on this earth is to like sort of help people with music or whatever it is, you know, without, you know, kind of trumping yourself up too much, but it's like. It was your life purpose and, and you felt that it was the, you know, to quote the worst Jennifer Anderson uh, movie ever, like the juice was worth the squeeze. Like you were willing to kind of sacrifice these things um, in yeah. order to be able to. I don't um, to like I don't think you consciously do it. Like I think I, I think I thought, okay, I can have it all here. I can do, and I still want that. It's like I can have, you know, but it's, I think it, it's sort of a just putting your career first ahead of anything, I guess, or just putting the music first, or it's really not even putting the music first. I guess it's putting your career first because if you really put the music first, you might not spend so much time on the road. You'd actually stay home and work on the art more, right. which is something I'm trying to do now. But it's been, I mean, it's hard, man. It's been a hard road. You know, it, it really has. It's like, I mean, part of it is like you find some camaraderie in, in your guys and your band. But even that for me got weird over the years because I was like the leader and, there was like this weird separation for me and I sort of seek space anyway. So I have a weird separation, I think just as a writer and as an artist. So, I mean, it's been, it's, it's honestly been some really hard years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, the one thing this will uh, this will date us both, but um, uh, this is where I first found out about you, and I want to give a shout out to a friend of mine, Tanika Stewart, who was uh, a fan of yours. I'm not sure how she found out about you, but she posted uh, one of your albums, or uh, maybe it was even a music video, back on the MySpace days. That's why I'm saying it'll date oh. us. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And uh, and that's where I first found out about you, and then I started uh, doing my, uh, you know what some law enforcement people would refer to as stalking, um, but I'll just consider it research. Uh, but I actually started you know, checking you guys' website out and stuff like that. And one of the things that really appealed to me was you were the first musician I'd ever heard talk about that side of the business like you are now. You know, I remember reading stuff where you're talking about, man, we're trying to get a record deal. We're trying to get a record deal. And it's so tough right now. We've got a bunch of debt. And, you know, I, I love this life, but there's days when I don't love that life. And I, I don't feel like people understand that side of the business enough. They see these big stars and, you know, most people probably only go to stadium shows and, and things like that, but, you know, they don't see it when you're playing to your home crowd one night and it's packed and then you're playing, you know, to Dallas, Texas uh, with six people, you know, and you're like, okay, um, you know, and, and, and that's one of the things I really loved about you guys being able to do that uh, and, and share your journey, and I, I thought it was very authentic of it and I love that you were able to kind of open up and, and talk about that hard side of the music business. Yeah, I think I've always aired on the side of, of honesty, you know, so I tend to maybe overshare with people and I really, it doesn't really, I don't know, I, I'd rather do that, you know what I mean? I, I just, I like trying to tell the truth as accurately as I can, you know, so, and it's, yeah, it's tough out there. It's weird for me though, because I don't want it to be like I'm complaining or something, I, I but I I like to reflect the truth that is going on, you know, and and yeah, it's a, it's a roller coaster out there, you know, you play... You know, we play for 900 people a night when we play in Boston, and then we, you know, you play, you know, South Dakota on a Monday night. We're not playing for 900 people. Right, right. 
So right. you're like, what's the minimum? What are we getting here? Seventy dollars. Okay, it cost me two hundred bucks to get here. Great. All right. Awesome. Yeah, make it happen. Yeah, I mean, you just um, it's a roller coaster. So it's like it's like you better love it, or like why the hell are you doing it? You know. But it's funny. Like I don't know. I think people are exposed to so much nowadays. They've seen so many like. I don't know. You can see so many documentaries and you can just see the reality of people posting directly online and stuff like that. I feel like if people really want to know, they could really kind of, especially now, kind of just sort of see the reality of what's going on for bands and stuff. And I don't know. I think I just embraced that early on, like with my email list and stuff. I would just tell them like what's happening, you know, and I always try to wrap it up with some kind of gratitude because I really feel like that. And I don't want people to think I'm complaining, but um, and I agree with you. Yeah. I think I think I think present day it is a lot more transparent. You know, you get to see these bands, especially if you follow them on Facebook or you know these documentaries that you can get on like Netflix and YouTube's. But back when when I first heard about you, it was pretty rare. I mean, you know, I think that was still when the music industry was kind of in denial, like this Napster thing and this Internet things not going to work out. You know, and all these artists, I think were really and, and you know industry too were were kind of head in the sand and everything is going to keep going great and and you know you heard about at least i did uh, all these huge artists with the multi-million dollar record deals and you know selling millions of copies of their album within the first week of release and you know that just doesn't happen anymore i mean the industry has changed so much mm-hmm. totally and it's you know I, I i like to sort of look at it and try to ask the question and kind of explore what it is because like for me i've always felt like I don't know. Well, now I feel like, you know, it's sort of we, we, we sort of came through, we sort of lived through the end of like this bubble in history of like recorded music being worth so much. And that kind of got exploited or it did get exploited. And now it's like we're sort of coming back to reality of like it's just not worth as much as it was. It's just not. I mean, I wish it was. I mean, I wish it was for the sake of a lot of people who have sold it so much in the past. And 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 believe me, I, I still I still sell music and I'm quite thankful for the royalties that I get and the digital downloads and th- you know, and like I, that's part of how I make a living, but I've always gone about it. Like it's one room at a time and playing live. And I don't know. That's a, that's a whole, that's a whole ball of wax. But I do feel like I've always felt like through those years of bands getting huge and, you know, sort of like almost like from the Beatles onward, like through the stadium rock and all kinds of things. It's like, it sort of got really band centric. I feel like over those years, it became as much about the band as it became about the actual music where maybe in years and decades and eras past, it was like music was there for music's sake. If music was being played in a, in a ballroom, you know, those people were there to dance. They weren't necessarily going home and having posters of the band of the big band in their room. You know what I mean? Like it just became this really, it became about the bands I feel like. And I think that that's sort of the culture that perpetuates like being in a band. It's sort of like trying to make people to really give a shit about your band and who you guys are and stuff like that. And, and I think it's, I see that perpetuated and like, I see that, I see that in the way people promote their bands and I see people like, Hey, we got this big show coming up and, you should come out because it's a really big show for us. And so then we need your support. And I've sort of, I've never really subscribed to that approach. I've always just been like, you know, you should come to the show because there's some music that you're really going to like, like what's the benefit for them? You know what I mean? What's the benefit for, for the people listening. Yeah, it's not just that you're trying to hit a minimum. But like you say, it's not like, hey, this is a huge show for us. It's our album release party. It's like, okay, but what is the benefit to the end uh, listener or the person that's deciding? Well, do I, you know, do I get up and, and brave the weather and go pay a cover charge and, yeah. and all that stuff? And I think people have been burned so many times. I mean, I think like, you know, big, huge stadium shows now are like so expensive. And that's a whole ordeal with just the parking and everything. I mean, those have become a thing. And like just kind of a money suck in certain ways. And I'll still go and have a good time sometimes, but people can't really afford to do that much more than like, I don't know, once a year. I mean, it depends. And then small shows, I think if it's like, if there's this culture of like, it's all about the band, uh, then people are going to be burned by those small shows a lot of times, more often than not, you know? So I think it's like, I don't know. I think it's interesting days now. Like, I think, I feel like it's changing in certain ways. I, I wonder, I still, I still marvel at the fact that like, I don't know when I play a show that there's like 
200 people there like looking back at me like just staring at a band for two hours if, if i get 200 you know like what you know like it's just it's still it's like i just feel like there's still so much there's a lot you could do with the medium right you know a lot you can do with the room itself or maybe make the band just part of the the experience but not just like this thing you have to watch like a movie you watch people play instruments i'm still thankful that people do that i can't believe it and i still do it sometimes but it's like I just think there's a lot of there's a lot of ways that this could go. Yeah, and and the jury is definitely out, and it'd be interesting to see kind of how how it evolves and continues uh, to evolve from digital downloads to now streaming services like Spotify. Um, but one of the things that also impressed me uh, from the business side of things was you guys did a lot of things that I had never seen uh, bands at, at your level and even uh, you know higher levels do. Like I, you guys were the first band that I ever remember being able to listen to a live recording of that show and i remember um after i bought pretty much all your guys's albums i'd go uh and i think it was like internet archive uh or something like that and i'd go listen to shows that you guys had done and it was almost like i was able to kind of follow along the road and you guys even took that one step further um uh, not only with the band but with yourself where you'd actually make that stuff available for fans at a pay what you want price if you will uh and that included sometimes even just getting them for free, which I thought was very interesting how you guys seem to embrace the new and emerging technologies and the new realities of the business versus kind of saying, nope, we're only going to, you know, have, we'll only release one live album. We're only going to release one, you know, CD every X number of years and try to contain the music instead of trying and spread it and share it and get it out with the world. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember even on like my first demos that I would make, I'd be like, copy this and Play it for your friends, you know. If you, I mean, it's it was never about control. I just it, it just seems like you, you can't really control. It. I mean, you could go that route. Um, you know, I respect anybody's opinion on this, but for me, it's like if, if you know, if you're blessed enough for somebody to want to listen to your music, you need to allow them to listen to it. And then my model was sort of built on like, you know, then when I come to your town, you'll buy a ticket, right. or maybe next time you'll buy a ticket, or maybe you'll tell a friend, and maybe they'll eventually you know, buy a disc or something like that. I just feel like it's, I've been sort of really genuinely just trying to sort of build up goodwill for years. It's like, you know, buy a fan a beer and then you got a fan for life, you know? And it's like, I didn't sort of do that as a business model. I just did it because it's like, hey man, look at you. I can't believe you came out to hear this. Thank you, you know? <laughs> like so, and it's like those seeds have been planted for so long that I feel like I got a lot of goodwill to fall back on, whatever that means, you know? And I could sort of, I don't know, maybe that, you know, in some ways, I've you know I've maintained a successful business. In some ways, I'm a terrible businessman because I don't sort of maximize that stuff. And I'm an artist, and I just want to write poetry and that kind of stuff. So, but it, but yeah, I mean it's. Um, but you've done it on your terms. I mean, you're comfortable yeah. with it, and you know you talk about being appreciative and buying a fan of beer. Like one thing uh, struck me is that you know we did uh, make the six and a half hour journey down to see in Dallas uh, for my yeah. very first time, and That's and you guys were generally appreciative. You were like, I can't believe you drove all that way, and I'm like, and I'm I'm thinking like, why wouldn't I drive or why wouldn't anybody drive six hours? Like, I didn't think it was a big deal, but you guys were very appreciative of the fact that we did that. Um, so much so that we were driving home. This is hilarious. And you guys were playing the next night in Austin and we're driving and there's a thing and it's like, okay, go home or go to Austin. <laughs> and I told my buddy, I said, dude, I'm turning left. And he's like, what are you talking about? I said, call your wife, then, then call mine. And I was like, we're going to go see him tomorrow uh, in Austin. He's like, we just saw him. I was like, I know. And that's why we're going to go see him again. Um, <laughs> But I mean, that's that's what that's what doing that for a fan will do because it really turns them from being, I think, a regular fan to being, you know, uh, evangelical about it to use a, a fancy college word. But where, where you, they they spread the gospel and the word for you, and they're like, man, you're never going to believe. I mean, that that concert was I don't know how many years ago, but it still sticks out in my mind. Like, wow, okay, he really appreciated that, and it makes you more connected to the artist as a fan, and it makes you obviously want to see how you can support them, whether it's through uh, your pledge music drives or going to see you when you come to town, you know, or buying an album or merchandise at a show. I, I definitely think those things come back to help you way more than they come back to haunt you. Here I am on your podcast years. Right. You know? It's like, 
it all comes back around, I feel like. And and even if it doesn't, isn't it better to just be nice to people along the way? Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's always a good reputation to have and be like, yeah, like, uh, you know, go back to Bill Burr. Be like, I don't want to be dead and be like, uh, he paid his bills on time. Like, I got nothing. I got no – I got nothing good to say about that guy. He was a, He's a bill-paying son of a bitch. That's all I got. Like, so I, I definitely, <laughs> definitely agree with that. So you guys toured, Rhyme Up Blue toured uh, as a band, uh, the Rhyme Up Blue band toured for how many years? Well, with essentially that that core that group original lineup, it was a decade. It was 2003 to 2013, and then in 2013, that original lineup finally kind of drifted apart. We had one change. We had like we lost Lawrence, our viola player, in 2010, and we got Lyle on guitar. So there was a change, but for the most part, it was the same guys for 10 years. So let me ask, and if it's a sensitive thing or you want to talk about it, what kind of led to okay, we've been doing this for 10 years. What kind of led to Either let's take some space or let's try a different thing or let's go our own ways. Was there one thing? Was it just kind of a combination of being on the road for 10 years? Was it, as you say, growing up in your 20s and having families in your 30s? Or yeah. was it you wanting to kind of go out and, and be your own man on your own again, so to speak? No, it wasn't me. It was families, basically. It was, you know, it was like after 10 years, it was like literally it was like first Lyle was like, I want to be home with my kids. Right. And then a month later, Jay, who was like a founding member who like, you know, was really like the kind of linchpin of like the band sort of working, like just working on band stuff. Like he, he was he a month later was like, I want to be home with my kid. <laughs> you know, like it was kind of it was just time. It was like it was like it was basically those two guys, one right after another, saying that they're leaving the band. And it wasn't like it was, you know. What I feel like blessed about is that it was for good reasons. It was like those people wanted to be with the people they loved at home and, and build their families and just sort of – we were going crazy on the road for so long, you know, and they did it. But eventually they're like, you know, I want to be home. And it was like – so it wasn't like, you know, I want to get off the road because I hate you. It was like, you know, and we had tensions just like everybody else. I'm, You know, like it wasn't wasn't all peaches, but it was – that's not why we ended, you know. It was really like guys wanted to be with their families. And then I hadn't had a break in 10 years like anybody else. And, you know, and then it was when I was looking at when I sort of like when the dust settled and I sort of looked at what I had left, it's like those guys would have kept going. But I was like, you know what? We, I, I, I wasn't going to lose the guy. Like I never sort of to me, it was always a band. And I always said that. And it wasn't just me and a bunch of side players. Do you know what I mean? So to to replace Lyle and Jay and keep going and call it the same thing. That just seemed, and I just, and I hadn't had a break again in a decade, and I was like, I just can't do it. I was like, I think we need to put a stamp on this thing and call it a day and call this something special, this thing that we did for 10 years, and, and let's just do it. You know, we did two final shows in Boston and sort of called it a day, you know, and then it was, I mean, it was really confusing. I've thought more hours than I care to even admit about, like, just even the name Ryan Moplu versus Ryan Moplu band and what it means and what the band means and what those guys mean to me. And it, to me, it was like, I was really just trying to honor them, those guys as like this unit. And then, so I didn't call anything Ryan Moplu band after that for, you know, the next year and a half or so I wouldn't do it. But then eventually it's like, I play solo shows and I play band shows and I was starting to put together new bands and promoters want to know what to call it and they want to say it's me with a band. So eventually it was like I had to start calling things Ryan Mopley Band again. Even though at first I was against it. I was like, no, it's those guys and that's it. But it was like, you know, it's just kind of, it's just, it just makes sense. You know, it's just kind of practical. It's like if I'm coming with a band, I kind of need to be able to call it Ryan Mopley Band. So was there ever a time when you're going through that transition where you're saying, okay, let's wrap this thing up. Let's, let's do our final shows. Um, and, and was there ever a time when you just thought maybe about stopping yourself? I mean, you've been on the road for 10 years, you know, you hadn't had a break. You guys were, you know, successful, but maybe not to even the level, you, you know, you talk about Dave Matthews earlier, maybe you hadn't hit that level. Was there ever a time where you were just like, maybe I got to go do something different or, or maybe this isn't for me or was that passion still inside of you where this is it and this is it for me? Well, I think about that stuff. I mean, I, I try to be open to, to whatever, you know what I mean? If I, if I, if I get called, if I feel some kind of calling to do something else, then I will do that. You know, I, I really feel open to that kind of thing. 
but I haven't had that calling <laughs> and I still feel called to do this. I still feel, I still feel the music, you know, and I still get ideas and I want to work on them and I just want to write better songs and become a better musician. I still feel that drive, you know, I think it's less of the drive of like, let me go crazy on the road. Like I used to, like when I would see other bands tour schedule and they were hitting all these cities and all these different venues that I hadn't been to yet or something, or a lot of them I had, but other ones I'd be like, oh, look at their schedule. I want that. I used to be like envious. Now when I see other people's like full tour schedules, I'm like scared. I'm like, I do not want that. <laughs> so, cause I'm just tired. I mean, I, I want to still tour, but I want to be focused about it and, I just sort of don't have that drive to go crazy on the road like I did. I've been going crazy the last two years to kind of put together other bands. And for me, it's been it's almost been about just proving to myself that I can even do this with other guys. Because up until 2013, I didn't know if I could do this without those guys. I really didn't, like, not put together bands and stuff. Because they just built this such a shell around me. I mean, they really built this amazing thing around me and my songs and around the way that I played. And... And so it sort of forced me to become a better musician and a better band leader to, to, to do it with other people and to have to communicate these songs to new people and to have to get up on stage in front of, you know, in front of an audience with people who I've only got a few hours of time playing music with as opposed to like our 10,000 hours of being on the road with these, these other guys, you know. So the whole thing has been that's kind of part of why I'm so exhausted right now is because I've just been working so hard to sort of sort of keep the thing moving over the hill and just sort of prove that I can do it with other people. And it's different. It's not the same, you know, but it's, you know, so, and now I've sort of proven that I can do that. And now I'm really exhausted. And now I need to take a time to kind of regroup before I, before I step forward again. But it's, you know, I still feel, I still love making music and I still love playing live for people. And I, I just, I do want to continue to do that. But as you get older, it's like, you got to find sort of, you know, you just, <clears throat> I don't know, you keep finding the ways to do that. You know, but it's it, it like I said, it's been a hard 10 years. It's like, you know, my body's burned out. I'm, I haven't sort of put my roots down in certain ways. And I, I need to kind of figure that out. I, I need to figure out how to take care of myself so that I can kind of keep taking care of others. And I definitely want to talk about that. Uh, but one thing I do remember distinctly uh, when you kind of started going back out on the road was uh, that you were uh, for a time you were driving some rented. I think it was like a Hyundai Sonata or something like that or, or something like that around. Um, I, I remember you, uh, I can't remember what show it was you were talking about this, but you were like, yeah, I wrote the lyrics of the song while driving down the highway um, or, you know, touring kind of uh, across the world uh, for, for a couple months. So you start doing your own solo stuff again. Now I'm starting to hear, and this is exciting because I actually uh, wasn't familiar with this. Like, are you trying to put together or have you put together kind of a second inclination of the Ryan Mont Blue band to where you're going to maybe go back to doing more uh, with bands and maybe less solo? Or are you trying to kind of uh, balance that? That or figure it out or still well it's 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 not so cut and dry with me like I, I definitely wasn't trying to I've not tried at all to be like this is the new Ryan Mont Blue band but it's it's sort of people have to perceive it that way. right it's like it's so much easier to tell the story of like Ryan was solo then he got a band then he went solo again now he has a band again but it's really like I mean, I was playing solo shows all those years. Yeah, and while the, I didn't even mention I, this. You, you know, while the band was doing five albums, you managed to release two individual albums as yeah. well. You had Stages in 2009, mm -hmm. and then For Hire uh, in 2012. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stages too. So, like, yeah, like I was always doing it. And then it was sort of once the band split up, then it was like. It wasn't even out of necessity. It's like, I love to play solo. It's sort of something I got away from a little too much with the band. So I think, and now I'm putting together new bands and now I am getting, I am getting towards something more solid for sure. Like I've been working pretty consistently with the same rhythm section, although there have been other people, but I have like, there are some players now who I'm getting ready to like kind of really dig in with and, and they've, they've been playing all this older material with me, but I want to dig in with them like as artists and write new stuff. And so I have ideas definitely for the future of like a band. Um, and that's happening. But I also like, I know I got away too much from the solo thing, which is because I love doing it so much. Um, so I want to balance it out more. So I don't think, I don't see it being like so much the band all the time. Like I just, you know, what I've been saying for the last couple of years, it's like sort of like the days of like, 
this is the band and we're getting in the van forever and we're going to play a million shows and that's it. It's like, that doesn't seem like where I'm at. It seems like more focused. It's like, all right, this is the band I have for this and we're going to do this project and we're going to do this run. And, you know, it, I mean, it is getting more consistent. But um, and you're also giving yourself some time uh, to to take care of yourself uh, because one thing that you've uh, I've I've seen you post and even uh, I think I've gotten a few emails about it is kind of your personal development uh, and taking care of yourself and, and growing as a human being which as someone that loves that type of stuff I love seeing you do that um, and, and you've done some pretty interesting things the one that sticks out to me you did like a seven day silent retreat um, where like uh, you, yeah. you, where you weren't allowed to speak at all right. Yeah, I do it a few times. I do. Yeah, it's a ten day. Um, oh, it's ten days. Yeah, do, okay, wow, holy cow. Uh, I do vipassana meditation, and it's you have to to learn that technique. You have to go for a ten day course, and it's um, yeah, you observe noble silence for essentially nine days, but you're there for ten, and you yeah you I mean it's you basically live like a monk for for the ten days at a time, and the, and you uh, yeah you just sort of learn this technique, and that's it's it, I mean it. Yeah, that's been a big kind of central part to my life in the last few years. It seems like that has uh, maybe helped uh, helped you as well, like you say, kind of a central part. Uh, it's funny. I was listening. It was an interview you were doing. I was talking about that. And I guess at the end, you guys are allowed to finally talk. And you had a roommate, and he thought you were Russian or something like that. It was yeah, – he was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, you're Russian, right? And you were like, no, 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 I'm not. Yeah. It's really funny. I mean you, you're in there for, you know, for 10 days, and you're – eating with people across the table. You're in with the same group of men, basically. There's, they separate the men from the women. And there's no, there's no, your noble silence means there's, there's, you know, you don't talk and you don't make eye contact and you essentially stay in your own trip. You know, you're in your own, it really works. I mean, it's really a, kind of a beautiful way to learn that practice. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, your brain is, our brains are wired in so many funny ways. I mean, it's like you just, I would, I made up names for the people that were in there and I just like, just anything to get by. The first time you do it, it's like, I feel like just like survival. And it's like, well, I was going to say, yeah, it I, sounds like it's probably like a survival thing. Yeah. You're like, I just got to name these people. That's all I have to do. It is. It was really hard. I mean, it's, it's, it was physically very, very challenging and it was, it was one of the hardest things I've ever done, but I've done it since. And yeah, it's beautiful, but it's, but yeah, it's like you, I would make just have all these preconceived notions in my mind about what people were like, and I would make things up. And and you're also you're going through your own shit while you're in there. You're going through like pain and stuff is coming to the surface that's been down there for years, and you're really like it's really a struggle. So you're just kind of you know you can be just kind of nasty in your mind, and I'm just like oh look at this guy, he thinks he's so great or whatever it is. And then it, without fail, at the end of the ten days, you talk to that person, and they're like the sweetest person ever. And it's it's really just a lesson in like we really create our realities every minute, you know, and it's like you really create your own perception of how people are and sort of how you see things. And this was such a vivid lesson of that because nobody's saying anything. It's like, how do I know this guy thinks he's so great? He's not even saying a word. He's not looking at me. He's not doing anything. It's just like, you just, you know, you, our minds are funnily powerful, funnily, funny, powerful things. You know? So, Oh, through all of this, through the touring, through all, like the the thing I always wonder is how do you even find time to one live life and then two kind of go through that creative journey or process to write about music to you know give yourself time to put together these albums. I mean, uh, it doesn't sound like it's something where you're saying okay, in June of next year we're releasing this album. So I. If it's not that and you're, you know, you're not kind of working a calendar, if you will, I mean, how do you find time, especially in today's like ultra connected society where, you know, you've got to have a Facebook and a YouTube and an Instagram and a, you know, and a Periscope now and all these, like, how do you find time to kind of unplug or even if you don't unplug back away and really kind of embrace the creative side when it comes to writing music or producing uh, a new album or anything like that? Well, I think the meditation practice has really, I, I mean, I think in some ways it's kind of saved my life as far as, as like unplugging and getting away from all that. And then, I mean, because yeah, honestly, the other side of it for me, the way I've done it is like, I think just like singular focus, just go in one direction for as long as I can physically even handle. Like I just... I don't know. I've sort of been obsessed with this whole thing of like playing and writing and playing music. And it's got, I mean, it's, and it's, I've done so, 
you know, to the detriment of my own mental health, my own well-being and stability. I mean, I really have. It's I've really run run the rails, like really close to just completely breaking down. And it hasn't been all good, you know, to be honest, to be perfectly honest, you know. But I think like, you know, I, I just believe in it so much and I just feel this stuff so much. Like when I write a song, like I generally like I just feel it come up from the depths and I it's in my head and it's in my body and when it really comes up, it's like, it doesn't usually come at once. I just hear a tune or I play something or I have to sing something. And it's like, I just have to do it. I feel it. It's part of my being. It's like, it's an expression of my whole being in that moment. When it comes up, I mean, there, there, there are different ones. You know, I write some, <clears throat> I write some silly ones too. And just, you know, I try to just keep writing, but, but it's really just been like, it's kind of like what you said before. I mean, I write a lot in the car while I'm driving 80 miles an hour. I, take little memos on my my voice memos on my phone and I dictate into my phone some lyrics or I have notebooks all the time that I write into or I keep notes on my computer. It's sort of, it's it's never far from me. I'm always writing little by little, um, always tweaking different things. A song will come into my head that I had an idea for like two years ago and it's a lot of them take a long time and I sort of be driving and I'll just work on one verse of it, a few lines of it and try to get it right. And it's almost, it's been, I've been a little, I think, too hard on myself and kind of too much editing in some ways because I just, I'd like to put out more, you know. <clears throat> and that's part of the deal now of like, I'm trying to really kind of not take as many shows and, and um, kind of shut it down for the rest of this year a, a bit. I and mean, I'm still doing stuff. I'm always playing, but it's, but it's less than I was. And I want to, because I need that time. It's funny, I, I just did these shows with Mavis Staples out in, um, in the UK, actually, I'd never been over there, but I was, she has this amazing, her, her band is incredible and they're all like full of just amazing stories and their own careers are just incredible. And this woman, Vicky, who sings, um, sings backup vocals from Mavis, she's had an amazing career on her own, but she just put it so succinctly. She was like, we were talking about touring and just kind of the toll that it takes on you and playing shows. And, and she was like, yeah, you know, it's almost like as musicians, we're required to do this thing that keeps us from doing the thing that we do. You know what I mean? It's sort of like we make music, but because of that, we have to play these shows that sort of get in the way of us making and creating music. And it, that's really kind of where it's at. And so it's like, it's just a, it's a constant like diligent thing to find the, find the balance to do that. And it's sort of like, you know, it's like, a, it's like a tail that grows back. You gotta be diligent. You gotta just, you know, and sort of, that's where I've been at lately is kind of just feeling like, man, I, I've done all this work to kind of sort of reestablish that I can do a band, I can do it with other people, but it's come at the end of us feeling like I'm just keeping the hamster wheel rolling, like I need to stop this wheel for a little bit so that I can create the stuff. Because at the end of the day, it's like if I don't if I don't create music, what the hell am I doing? Right. It's like someone that works in their business but maybe not on their business to have a crazy parallel. But, yeah, you've got to have time to create the art so you can go out, so you can share with the world. And, and your songs do take a long time. But I love – one of the things I love about listening to music is that your songs, even the even the funny ones uh, or the less serious ones, if you will, they have, they have vivid imagery and they have a story and you can follow it. I mean the song that I have on my wall, if it comes around, I love that song because I can close my – eyes listen to that song and i can see what i imagine in my head is going on with that and you know that obviously takes time to create and i can also feel the emotion behind that song and it's 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 yeah. one of those that's on heavy rotation for me all the time that, that song to me is that what that song is 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 me writing a song about writing songs about somebody that song is about writing songs and the fact that I'm not going to write songs anymore about this one person. It's just kind of fun. It's like, it, I don't know, you can keep digging and sort of write about anything. But no, I appreciate it, man. But I'm interested in this notion of like, I think they're like the thing I was saying about the thing that you do keeps you from doing the thing that you do. I think I have to imagine that there's just parallels in any business of that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and there's parallels in a lot of things. You know, I, um, you know, to flip this up, you know, I have to take a day a week. I, I basically have a, what I call my creative day. And I yeah. tell everyone, leave me the hell alone. Don't call me. And I, because you just need that time to sit and think. And uh, sometimes oh. you just need time to let things just process and develop over time. Uh, in, in a lot of ways, it's like therapy. You work on it a little bit, you get a little better, you improve, you plateau, you improve, you plateau. 
plateau. And I, I, I find with, with so many people, they don't take the time to do that. They're on the hamster wheel, and I, and I am definitely guilty of that too. I mean, I, I blink yeah. and I'm like, holy crap, it's August? Like, why well, didn't we just have New Year's yesterday? And, and the thing I, I had to understand for me was, you know, life is going to pass us by no matter what unless we stop and take the time to say, okay, uh, this is important enough for me to work on and to give it, it also not only time to work on, but time to develop because it's not like, you know, I'm sure you can at this point if you wanted to, but it doesn't sound like your process where you're going to sit down and say, I'm going to write a song a day or I'm going to do this or, or that. It's, it's something that a little part comes here and a little part comes there and over mm -hmm. life and experience and giving your brain uh, some downtime, those things all come to the surface. Mm -hmm. But I do want to get more disciplined about it. You know what I mean? But like, I need space to do that. Right. I would like to like have the space to like, be like, you know, I'm going to write for three hours a day starting at this time. And this, I mean, that would be huge. I'm, I'm reminded of like, there's that great Ted talks with the guy who I think he's, I think it's about sabbaticals and he's like, he owns a design house in New York. That's like super successful. And I think it's every five years or every seven years, he shuts down for a year. He shuts the whole thing down, and it's a big opera. He's clearly very successful, but he shuts the entire thing down for a year, and he goes on sabbatical, and he goes somewhere. He has a plan. He goes to, like, I think he went to Thailand one year or something like that, but he, he doesn't just go and kind of screw off and do nothing. He, it's like a constructive rest. He has a plan for it, and he rests, though, and that's where – and, he's like, from that one year, he ends up making more money overall – even though he's making nothing for a year, he ends up more successful overall because he took that time. He took that space. I think the idea of space is like so kind of crucial for people. Well, and I, I think also, uh, you know, society doesn't really put a premium on space. You know, if you take time off or if you want some downtime, it's like, what's wrong? Can, can you not do it? Yeah. Instead of like, uh, you have to have every second of every day, you got to get up, you got to hit the ground running yeah. and you have to exhaust yourself. And, you know, what do you mean you can't handle this? Or what do you mean you need downtime? Like that, that's yeah. looked up, that's looked uh, down upon, I think. I think especially in America, it is for sure. I think it's it, from what I hear from some other countries, it seems like they have more kind of just sane ways of dealing with that and dealing with vacation as like a as a thing. It's not like it's not slacking off. It's like a necessary part of living and breathing as a human. And nowadays, like with you know, now that I have this computer in my pocket every second of every day, it's like oh, I'm waiting in line. Uh, let me use this downtime. Oh, I'm on the train. Let me use. It. There's no, there is no downtime. You fill up every second with reading about something or posting something or liking something. And it's like, I think for that reason, I mean, for me, meditation is like the, is kind of the way out. I mean, it's a very kind of beautiful way to like just create some space in your life. You know, I think people are going to need that space. And that space applies to every. I mean, it's like, God, that, that applies to music in so many ways. So how, uh, think, your meditation, how, how often are you doing it and how long do you typically meditate for? I do it every day and, you know, I, I try to, you know, it's, I meditate a lot. I meditate every day and I try to do an hour in the morning and an hour. In the wow. Night. That's kind of the technique. Yeah. And it's a lot. That's a heavy practice. That took me years to build up to. That's not, if people try to do that right off the bat, you're not going to meditate. I don't even, that's from me. Like, you know, I've gone to these courses. I've lived like a monk for 10 days at a time. That's me building up a practice. When I first started doing it, um, you know, I would just try to do it. The, the main thing is it's a practice. You got to do it every day. So even if you do, if you, if, if, it's like, if you try to practice for two hours and then you never do it again, it's going to do nothing for you. It's like, do a minute, do 10 minutes, do five minutes, do a minute. But if you do it every day, that's it totally will transform your life yeah, well our uh, our mutual uh, friend uh, if you will Kamal Ravikant he's got the love yourself like your life depends on it you know the yeah. thing that really yeah. say again I'm going to meet him next oh, week man. in New York. I'm going to warn you right now. He's a hugger. So just get ready to hug it out with that guy. <laughs> he's, he, dude, he's, a, he's a great guy. But the thing that I loved about his book, the, the thing was he was like, it's seven minutes. And it was like before yeah. I'd always made excuses why I couldn't even try it or even yeah. start. And it was like, dude, it's seven minutes. Like, yeah. And if you make it a priority and you make it a time, um, I, I, that stuff can develop into a habit overall uh, very, very quickly. Well, the whole thing about it is repeating it. The whole thing is like doing it today and then doing it tomorrow. 
and then that's or doing it today is really the, the approach you have to have but you need to do it every day and and if you do that it's really those small and it's it's sort of in the beginning it's important kind of not to do more time than that like don't try to be a hero and be like i'm gonna sit for 45 minutes because like, then it's like the next day you will not do that and you'll get on yourself it's like the, I think there's, a, there's something really powerful about just like doing something for a small amount of time. But if you do it every day, it will really transform you. All right. Well, let's get to some less heavy topics. I, I agree with everything you say there. I would recommend you guys pick up his book, uh, Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It. It's got a great, very simple uh, to do meditation uh, in there, not simple to actually do. Like it, it's like, oh, okay, great. But when you sit down to try it, it's, it's, it's like anything. You know, you're going to suck at it at first. Your mind's going to wander. You're going to mm-hmm. be like, this is stupid because uh, I've had that thought. But if you really – just sit there over time, uh, and, and I find any time that I, I've I've done that practice, and I go months with doing it, and then months without, and then I'm like, man, things are crappy. Why is it? I'm like, well, let's get back to the stuff that things were good. It's yeah, you but, lost your practice. Let your tail grow back. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You know, a lot of people tell me when they first meditate, they're like, oh, I can't do it. My mind just wanders like crazy, and it's like, no, that's actually like you are meditating. That like. That's what our minds do. They wander. But the fact that you're even taking five minutes just to try to observe that is like you are meditating. That's it. That's the, you're doing the thing. People are like, oh, how do I know if I'm doing it? So it's like, well, you're, are you observing? This, there's a million ways to meditate too. But I mean, like, you know, you're, you're really just observing. Meditating is observing. And it's like, if you're like, oh my God, my mind is going crazy. You're observing that. And that's like step one. That's like you are meditating. Right, yeah, and there's a million ways. There's a million apps. You do it the way that works best for you. Um, but I agree with you. I think that that uh, that's going to become a bigger thing because people now it's like they need a digital detox. It's like if I and I'm guilty. I, I uninstalled Facebook on my phone probably two weeks ago, and it's crazy how many times a day I'm unconsciously trying to find that button now, and it's just like what what's going on because of that? Like it's it's just because we we train ourselves in both good and bad habits. Yeah, I'm a full-blown addict to my phone. Yeah, sure. well, yeah, for sure. All right, so there actually is a user uh, or a listener question uh, for you this time. Uh, uh, you uh, you met my friend Sue. Uh, now, I did not get Sue's permission to use her last name, so I'm just going to give her my honorary last name. So, uh, so Sue Castleman, this question is for you. Uh, you met Sue <laughs> at, uh, at one of your shows there, and she loved the song Ghost, uh, and she is heartbroken uh, that she cannot seem to find it on any album. So she wanted to know is that a song that you plan on uh releasing anytime soon for mass consumption yes that's a whole man i so wish i had that song recorded already and ready i've been so frustrated with the process of like not recording that song yet it's coming that's the song i feel really strongly about and i'm i'm dying to get it out there believe me so at this point there's just live versions of it but um I will be recording it. Yeah, so let me ask you, man, because it's a question I had, but we had kind of moved past it. But the thing I, I try to understand from artists is, you know, is there ever a time where you kind of get angry or or bitter at the industry for, you know, what they promote and what they don't put out there? Or people who maybe, you know, who well, no, not maybe, but aren't musicians telling you like, oh, man, that's a waste of time for you to do that. Like, how do you, I mean, one, do you ever get angry and, and upset with that? And like, two, how do you pro- process that or not let it defeat you for lack of a better term yeah i mean that's a tough one to be i mean honestly i get angry and intense and all that all the time and anxious and i and but the problem is for me i tend to do it's not i don't really get angry at the industry as a whole i just think it's a waste of time and for me it's like dude if you like Justin Bieber, that's fine. Go listen to Justin Bieber. That has nothing to do with what I'm doing. That's totally, you know, like, I think it's fine. I, people get so worked up and they, and they, you know, put Kanye West in like a conversation about the Beatles or something. And it's like, who gives a shit? Like, let, I mean, you know, I mean, I, that's a whole other thing. But just for me personally, like, I really try to, I don't really get upset about that kind of thing. I think I try not to get upset with, what people like even if it's something being jammed down their throat and they're buying it it's like i can't fix the world like that's fine you know i just kind of got to feel blessed for anybody if if anybody listens to me and the fact that i get to pay my rent from doing this is like wonderful and then the, the sky's the limit the thing i get pissed at is like and this is my struggle like this is my cross to bear like i've gotten really angry at the people around me 
and I've like lashed out to people because it's like I feel like I'm under so much pressure all the time to do this and I have certain ways I want to do it. And especially with something like management, it's like you're paying them, you know, a part of every dollar you make. And and it's, you know, and it's like it used to happen. I mean, I used to get pissed at the band members. I every People that have worked around me have felt my wrath <laughs> over the years. And it's I am not proud of it. And it's like I really just try to be good to the people around me. But it's like, man, I am I just feel this pressure and I feel the tenseness in my body of something. And, and it's such a wacky business that like things go wrong, you know, and sort of and it's, that's been my bad over the years. It's like I've kind of lashed out at people around me and they've taken it and they sort of get it. And I sort of come back to earth and, you know, I apologize. But it's like I, I've definitely been guilty of that. But it's been more of a local thing. It hasn't been because of the industry as a whole. It's because I feel like what I'm doing can be so difficult that it's like you want these details to go right. You want people to do things the way that, you know, you kind of envision them. And then when they don't happen, it's like, you know, God, it can seem like the end of the world. But it's really just like all these years kind of being built up. It's like in and of itself, it's like, God, you know, no one's going to die. We're just making music here. But I have trouble, you know, I have trouble kind of distancing myself. I've, I've sort of wrapped up so much of myself in this. Um, that that's kind of one of the things I need to kind of, you know, chill out on. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's tough, man. I'm, I'm guilty of that, and I'm, I'm working through the same issue. And, and I'll just share my, my part of that journey. It's, it's like it becomes our identifier or uh, – and, I, you know, the, for me, I, I will say candidly, I feel like I'm terrible in other areas of my life with friendships, relationships, things. But this is the one thing that I'm really good at. So I want to devote all my time and attention to it because it's where I get my validation. It's where I get my uh, happiness. It's where I identify with. And, and that is – I want to be clear. Like that's not healthy. Um, but it's it's what I have been guilty of. And maybe uh, that might be a little bit of uh, of what you're finding too. Oh, that's absolutely that's the same thing. I mean, I feel that 100 percent, you know, and it's, it's, it's a double edged sword because it's like that's part of the drive and the, you know, the, the sort of single minded craziness. Part of that is like what leads to your success and what leads to your vision. And you're just really cutting through the like all the shit that life, thro life throws at you to not do the thing you want to do. You need some of that. But then it's like you need to also kind of accept the ride as it is. And it's like this balance of like, you know, eyes on the prize, but not being sort of so attached to that prize. So it sounds like you're worried about maybe losing some of that fire or drive, as was I, because that was my number one. It was like, well, if I if I change that, like, then do I just become unmotivated all of the sudden? Do I, you know, is it, do I just like, is it, is it a total life change? But it sounds like for you that that's part of the thing is it's, it, you're worried about if I change that part of it or reduce it or change it in some way that it might affect your drive or determination in making things happen. Yeah, I think that's true, but that's really just fear. You know what I mean? That's fear of like doing something a different way. I really, cause ultimately it's like, ultimately I'm wasting energy by getting angry at people or ranting and raving or getting mad or down on myself. That's a waste of energy. You know what I mean? What I really, where I would like to be is like, you could still be very active. You could still be very like, driving towards this point but you can do it in a compassionate way where it's not you know when you want somebody to do something you tell them in a direct way and it has no emotion in it it's just like this is the way it should be and when it's wrong you say this is wrong but you're not saying you're an asshole this is wrong you're just like you know what i mean i think that's the distinction is like sort of s setting intentions and being direct with your intentions and not letting your emotions and all that crap get involved and so ends therapy time with uh, two drink Tim uh, Castleman. I always, it's funny, uh, you know, I'll have that. I'll be like, okay, today's a therapy episode, and here's what I'm working through. And I find that that uh, it yeah. definitely helps to do that. Sure. Two drink Tim and three drink Ryan. There you good, go. Man. I love it. I love it. So let me ask you a couple <laughs> questions, man, and I'll let you get on with your day so you can you can enjoy a yeah. rare uh, down day um, and uh, some some time to re refresh and recover. Now you're saving me, honestly, because the down day – I don't know what to do with the down days. So. <laughs> well, good. Well, yeah, we just do it. We can do a podcast every day like this. I have no problem with that. So. <laughs> Maybe we should. Uh, all right. Well, let's uh, all right, man. So for you, what is the future as you see it? What What is the future for Ryan Montblou? It's an interesting question because it's like I'm so – like I sort of – I feel the power of like being able to manifest anything you want. You know, for me, it's just – it's hard to – really think of what that is you know <laughs> for so long like all i want to do is make a living off of playing music and i've been doing that now for so long and kind of keeping that treadmill going that 
I don't know. Now it's a little more nebulous. I don't. I don't know. You know. I. I know. Um, I know. I want peace, and I want to help to create peace and space and others. You know. And I. And I think to do that, I need to kind of get my own, just my own house together. You know. And like just um, get my own house in order, kind of whatever that means. You know. So I think for me is. Um, I would like the future to be I'm, I'm a, I, I get a little more grounded, grounded in myself, grounded in the people that I love. And sort of it sounds real hippie, but it's true. It's like grounded in love in general. And then like it, from that, I want to make the best music I've ever made. I want to play the best shows I've ever made. I really still want to do this. And I really still feel this drive to get it better in ways that I can get it better. And part of that for me gets into like, I have this double thing that I feel like I do. Like I, I play these solo shows and, and when it, I can play like completely quiet listening rooms and as my songwriter heart loves that more than anything. And I love to be listened to and I, you know, silence is the canvas on which we paint. And I love that. And I love to just tug at the heartstrings with the writing. And there's, there's, there's a power you can have in that kind of setting to draw people in. That being said, I also feel the power of having a band and making people move viscerally and really shaking their bodies and getting people to dance and feel this kind of visceral joy physically and with a groove, you know, out of, so for me, it's like, I want to do both of those things. And so I don't know, I want to, I guess, find a way to do both those things successfully in the same show. And that's kind of my quest. You know, I've seen some bands do that. Uh, you, we mentioned Dave Matthews. Um, you know, I, I actually saw him in Dallas last year, and they did like an acoustic set to open. Then they took a little break, yeah. and then they brought the full band out. And that was pretty interesting because yeah. you got – for me, I got the best of both worlds because I, I – don't get me wrong. I love the rhyme and blend music, but, but the stuff that I love from you is all solo acoustic because I, I, I enjoy the creative part of it, and I love the lyrics, and I like being able to hear your voice without, to me – the other distractions of having to listen to the band and, and, but I also see the upside of it, but, but it's gotta be tough to kind of manage both those animals in the same journey for sure. It is. Well, and I appreciate you saying that, man. I, 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 um, yeah, I think I've done both. I think now I'm getting to like sort of in the last two years, I've sort of put together these bands, which essentially in some ways have been a continuation of what the old band was doing. And it's just sort of even just to see that I could do it. But even those, some of those shows, they get a little bit away from me. They get, there's a lot of solos. There's a lot of like, I don't, I'm ha like, I don't always find the balance of the writing with the band and stuff like that. So that's something I feel like I could get a lot better at. And I feel like I will, because I want to, I want it to be about the songs, but also, you know, it's like, if you see Paul Simon, it's like those lyrics touch you and they, and they and they grab at you and they really get you somewhere deep down but then at the same time he's got like amazing players amazing percussion he's moving your body too it's like i mean there are a lot of people that not a lot of people but but people do that sort of thing and i, I, I want to be one of those guys yeah, i definitely <laughs> i definitely know you'll uh, you'll figure it out for sure speaking of music what uh, what's in heavy rotation on your playlist what what's something right now that you're really into whether it's a band or a type of music what's something that that you seem to be listening a lot to or is it like uh, that's what i do for a living and oh, i just i prefer silence over everything no, uh, I mean, well, I do prefer sounds more than you'd think, you know, because I'm around music so much. But I mean, I love music and I love that, you know, we all have to connect with that feeling of it taking you away and why we do this in the first place, you know. But that Garen Mason uh, disc that I was talking about, Love and Sound, is like still, I still listen to that all the time. I have for the last couple of years and I just, I love that record. I love the way it sounds. I love his guitar playing. Um, but then, um, I don't know, it, my my listening is kind of all over the place. Um Man, I, I don't even. It's like hard. It's like I'd have to go into my phone and be like, "Oh yeah, I am listening." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I am listening to Taylor Swift's greatest yeah. hits. Yeah, yeah. Or, or yeah. Yeah. I have to check that out. Yeah, John now. Mayer's uh, "Substitute Teacher Blues," which I love. Uh, one one of the albums that you were talking about, how um, you actually were a sub for a while at your old high school. Is that right? Yeah, sure. That's when I would do that song. That's why I kind of don't do that song anymore. Because for me, it was part of like. You know, the whole thing was like I would talk about subbing that day in the song, in the intro and stuff and how I hated it. And Yeah, I used to do it. I did it for a few years. It was a it was an interesting gig, you know, but it sort of allowed me to do the music at night and 
it was kind of, it was optional work. It was like, you could say no, they would call you in the morning and be like, no, I can't do it. Like if you had a big show the night before or whatever it was. And, um, and yeah, if you can face a class full of, full of high school kids at seven in the morning, you can pretty much face any audience. Yeah, like. That's probably, uh, probably good. Uh, what about books? Any, any books that you've been into or reading a ton? Uh, I just started reading this Elaine de Botton book. That guy's amazing. This is the first time I ever read him though. But, um, what did I read? I just read the Four Agreements for the first time. I love that one. I have never read that, but it's been it's been highly recommended. So I'm yeah, gonna... that's really powerful. I, I really like it. Um, uh, there's a lot. I have like a stack of books I'm sort of reading at all times. Um, there's one go- There's one called um, uh, Never Can Say Goodbye, which is like about all these different writers. Each chapter is a different writer talking about their love of New York City, which is really nice because I just moved here. So. That's been cool to sort of approach it as a writer. Um, there's a lot of books. I have a stack i got to get into. So when you're not doing my podcast and you're not touring across the, the world, what do you like to do for fun or downtime or, or relaxation besides just, of course, sleeping and relaxing? Yeah, I, I need to explore those things more. But um, I really – I have a love and appreciation for skateboarding, and I, I, I don't – I'm not – uh, very good skateboarder. I don't. I'm not exciting to watch. Um, so you and Tony Hawk can, won't be doing a doubles platform anytime soon. Probably not anytime soon. It wouldn't. I mean, I don't know. He could like do some stuff over me or something. But you know, it's like I can ride. I like riding bowls and riding half pipes and stuff. But it's not. I'm not very good. I don't do it very much these days. I kind of just ride my longboard around Brooklyn and I love it. I just like cruising. But I'm a fan of that stuff. I kind of geek out on the videos. I still get. I still have a subscription to Thrasher magazine that I've had since '91, and I've saved every issue. I kind of like. I sort of get. I like just seeing what people can do with that because to me, it's an art form. It's you know, the X Games thing is cool, and there's like they make it a sport, and it's kind of a competition, and that there's something cool about that. But for me, it's the art. Like, there's people express themselves on those things, and it's pretty amazing to see what people can do. So I kind of geek out on Definitely. that. Definitely. Now, for people who want to support independent musicians or, or music in general, I, I ask every guest this: What's the best way to do it? Is it buying merchandise at a show? Is it because it certainly isn't streaming uh, their album? Is it buying uh, merch and, and CDs? Is it doing things uh, like your pledge music campaign? Like, what's the best way to get the money in your pocket so that you can continue doing your work? Yeah, I mean, for me, honestly, it like it all helps. For me, it's like it's just kind of like if it's like if you like the stuff, listen to it. It's just the attention. It's like if I can be so blessed as to receive your attention to this and it works for you, then it's like the rest kind of takes care of itself. I mean, that being said, in the business sense, you know, uh, I own all my records. I don't, you know, so it it kind of all filters to me eventually. It's not like I don't really pay a lot of middlemen for like. I don't pay a record label. It's like when you buy a 99 cent download on iTunes, like I get 70 cents of that. So iTunes is pretty amazing still. Like it's just so much more money compared to like the streaming. But that being said, like I'm quite happy with my Spotify royalties. Like a lot of people complain and I get it, but those are on the rise more and more. And while iTunes is less and less, and that's just kind of the way it is. I'm not going to rail against it and tell people you have to buy each of my tracks for 99 cents. If you want to stream it, stream it. Just listen, listen to the stuff. That's all I ask, you know? And then it's like, if it makes sense for you to buy a ticket, come to a show and I will give you the best show I can. You know, it's all those things. They really do all help and they really do all go directly to me really to this to this effort you know well you know i've i've i think you've done two pledge uh music uh campaigns uh i've supported both of them but i'm always curious uh as an artist uh i'm sure there I, i'm guessing there has to be a love hate relationship with that because you get to do some amazing things like i would have never been able to get these uh handwritten lyrics from you that are a prized possession here in the pot but as as an artist like i know it's great to be able to connect with fans and do we did a private skype show one time which was awesome but i mean is it Mm -hmm. the downside of it is well one you probably got to fulfill all that stuff of course but trying to find all the time uh to do that like what's your opinion on those do you I i know they help support the cause but is that the best yeah. way or is there a better way to kind of, of help out? And I don't feel like I asked that question great, so forgive me for No, I know what you mean. I mean, I, I think about that stuff a lot because, I, you know, yeah, they are kind of um, 
It's interesting. I mean, the, the fulfillment of those of those things is a lot of work, and that's that's the part that I think like maybe a lot of people don't see it. And, and I have people helping me out with it too, um, and people sending packages. And I'm like blessed to have people helping me do it. And even that being said, it's like I still have to do stuff and just do. There's a lot of work involved with fulfilling it. And um, I like the thing I like about pledge music as opposed to some of the others was that it like it. I don't feel comfortable having a big dollar sign out there in front of my name i try to keep that to a minimum and with some of these items i mean it's just the way it is it's like you know and i've sold guitars on ebay like as ryan mother's guitar because it's like for somebody who really wants it i can get a lot more out of that than just selling it as a random guitar so it's like but i try to keep that to a minimum there's something a little weird about being like hey buy me for this much money or buy a piece of me for this but i mean the reality is is like you know, I need to keep this rolling like anybody else and I need to eat, you know. So but those things, the thing that I that I like about the pledge model, uh, you know, any of those like Kickstarter or anything, it's like what what gets me through the day on them is that I'm offering somebody something for those things for that money. I'm offering you something for it. It's like, if this is worth this much to you, if an autograph record is worth this much to you that I'm offering that, if I'm, you know, it's like, it's not a, it's not a begging for money. Yeah. Right. You know, that I sort of would draw the line at like, that's just like the fans are the only reason that I can pay my rent anyway, that I'm even able to do this anyway. So for me to go back and be like, you know what? I need more. You need to give me this. It's like, eh, that like, I really, and I see some people do that with their pledge campaigns. Like, look, we made a record, and if you give us this money, we can do it. And it's like I just, yeah, I've, you got to be pretty sensitive about the way you present that stuff. So for me, the pledge thing is like, it's a, it's a pre-order. If you're gonna buy this record anyway, or if you have faith in me that I'm gonna make a great record, and you want it, if you pay for it now, that really helps me out. <laughs> like, you know, so there's, I don't think it's, you know, I think as I go on. I've I've never had a record deal. You know, I had a distribution deal years ago, and I ended up owing thousands of dollars to a record company. It's like great. How great did that work right. out? I've always I've always gone my own way. But I think for me now, where I have kind of all this roots built in, I think if it was the right people, I could not a big deal. Like it, I I think it would help me to sort of have a method to record music and put it out there where I didn't have to always go to the fans directly to support it. You know, because that just it is a lot of work. And it's and I don't want to sort of like keep going to that well of the fans and sort of, you know, I don't, I don't know. It can it, it's it certainly worked so far and I would do it again, but I just want to make sure that, you know, I'm not that the you know it's all appreciation. It's not like, you know, it's not dollar signs. It's not right. Of, people have enough stuff to worry about. They don't want to feel the pressure of me having to make money for a record. You know, I just want to give them the record if they want to buy it. We're doing great. You know? Right. Well, I mean, I'll tell you from a fan perspective, I love it when you guys do that. And I've I've done that with every band that I can support because, one, I feel like I get to support you. Uh, two, I feel like you're going to get a majority of the money. I know all them take a percentage of it. But the, the part I love about it is it's like you get an amazing, unique experience with a majority of those things that you just could not have uh, possibly on your own. There's no amount of money that I could bribe a doorman to get by, backstage with certain bands. But if they do a pledge music, right? Now I get to kind of hang out with that. And uh, and it's interesting because in all the bands that I've talked to, they all mention the same thing that you kind of alluded to, um, which is they have a hard time understanding, I feel, they have a hard time understanding why someone would want that. Like, I remember a band telling me, like, well, why would they want to do a VIP experience with them? And I was like, because you're rock stars, motherfuckers. Like, like that's what, like, <laughs> like they are so, I'm so appreciative of your skills and ability because I know there's no way I would ever want to do that or could do that or any desire like you do that it's like I'll pay the fee to have that experience and for me that's what it's all about it's like I can listen to any person in the world but I can only you know that that experience of me driving to see you only happens once in a lifetime that you know hanging backstage getting personalized lyrics you know I, I know you did like you know we'll go to a ball game um, you know if I was half a musician I'd be like sure I'll own a guitar that I'll play for 30 seconds and put on a wall that sounds <laughs> great. Um, but, you know, I think as a fan, I never I never feel like it's, hey, you know, we need more money. We need more money. It's like, I want to support this guy. I believe in what he does. And on top of that, I'm going to get something that no one else is going to be able to get or very few people are going to be able to get. And, and I think it's a win-win, uh, except for the fact, of course, that it takes a, a ton for you guys to fulfill of time and energy and space. Yeah. 
But then we get to make records from that and we get money from that. I mean, it's like all the money really does go directly into making the music. So in that sense, I mean, it is a beautiful thing. It is like going directly to the people who want the thing that you're making. And I mean, in that in that sense, it really just, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. In that sense, it, it makes a lot of sense. I love it. So speaking of money, uh, let's talk about how people can, can find more about you, uh, find where you're touring, <laughs> find your albums, support you any way they can. So is there a central location or is there a few websites that you would like to uh, to point people to so they can find out when you're going to be close to them? And, and of course, uh, and just as importantly, find out how to support you and keep you on the road and keep you doing your thing. Yeah, well, I'm pretty easy to find, you know, Ryan Montblou, M-O-N-T-B-L-E-A-U. RyanMontblou.com has like, you know, it's kind of, a, I guess, a central place. It's got all my dates. It's got everything. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on all that stuff. I have an email list. It's pretty, I tell people, and it's, it's true. It's like, it's pretty easy to track me down. And there's a contact page on my website. You can email me. You can email management. You can, you know, I have people who help me do this stuff. And, and, um, but I'm, you know, pretty readily accessible to people too. And, um, yeah, we're out there. It's just a, you know, it's a matter of kind of tuning in. Fantastic. Well, dude, I, I can't even begin to put into words how amazing this experience has been. This has been by far Good. my most amazing, uh, interview ever. And I am just yeah. honored to, uh, to be able to spend just a little bit of time in your world. I wish you all the success in the world. Uh, I look forward to whatever the future holds for you. Uh, and the next time, uh, that you, uh, that you release an album, I want to have you back on so we can help promote that in the right way and push people to the Ryan Mont Blue fan club for sure. So thank you so much for your time and